2021 spring meetings day two and we're live once more from the World Bank Group headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm Srimathi Sridhar and we're about two minutes away from our headline event on debt. But before we launch into that, here's my colleague Paul Blake with a quick look at what you can expect from today's live event and how you can get involved. The World Bank Group IMF meetings are virtual once more. And while our buildings are relatively empty when compared to past years, you connecting wherever you are have more opportunity than ever to take part. For weeks, we've been convening and recording in-depth conversations with some of the world's leading experts on the most urgent development issues of our time. Now for these spring meetings, we're proud to bring you four events that will play out over four days and cover four important themes, economic recovery, debt, climate, and vaccines. And while the main events are recorded, our subject matter experts are standing by live online right now to answer your questions and share your comments. Hi, I'm Nejma Sher. As each event plays, my colleagues and I will be answering your questions in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic in the live chat at live.worldbank.org. And while you're here, please vote in our poll. There will be a new question every day. And after each event, we'll be back here live from our headquarters in Washington, D.C. And on this socially distant set, we'll be putting some of the most popular questions that have come in online to senior World Bank Group leaders and experts. So what are you waiting for? Find all the details and share your perspective live.worldbank.org. And to have your say in today's event, use the hashtag debt for dev. Now, I'll be back here in about an hour's time for a live discussion with World Bank Group President David Malpass featuring your questions. And I'll also share the results of today's poll and much more. I do hope you'll stick around for that. But now let's jump into today's program, Rethinking Debt, Financing the Future Amid Crisis, hosted by the World Bank Group's Paul Blake. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Washington DC and welcome to the second day of our spring meetings in 2021. I'm Paul Blake coming to you from the atrium of the World Bank Group headquarters. And today the spotlight is on how we can help developing countries handle debt financing. Now one year in, COVID-19 has aggravated debt distress in the poorest countries and that could hurt their ability to finance their future. Reducing debt would allow countries to focus resources where they're really needed on building a green, resilient, inclusive recovery. So what's the best way to do this? And how can governments finance development without sinking deeper into debt? And what can we learn from the past? Now, over the next hour, we'll be joined by some top level guests and hear from people around the world directly affected by these issues. <laughs> Now, before we dive in, a reminder that there are lots of ways for you to get involved in this event. We're streaming in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic on World Bank Live and across our social media channels. World Bank Live is also where you'll find our experts poised to answer your questions in the live chat. And you can also upvote your favorite questions. We'll be putting some of those to the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpass, straight after this event. So share your comments at any time using the hashtag debt for dev Before our first discussion, let's take a look at how government debt can affect the lives of everyday people, for better or for worse. Here to explain is one young world ambassador, Zainab Haruna. She is the founder of Decipher Solutions, a youth-led social enterprise in her home country of Nigeria. When you or I need to buy a house, 
we might apply for a loan. Governments do the same and borrow money from different lenders to build roads, schools, and hospitals. It adds up to an enormous amount of money, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. How countries invest and handle their debts can determine whether their people thrive or languish. Let's look at why that is. Meet Emma, a young girl who lives in a rural village. Her country is not rich, but the government is investing in its people. Her school has got new computers and hired skilled teachers. Emma learns coding and discovers her talent for programming games and websites. She wins a scholarship and goes to college. And with a degree in computer science, she gets a loan and starts a business. Her company thrives and employs dozens of people. What made it possible for Emma to succeed? Every step of the way, the government invested in the future. It supported Emma and others like her with a robust education budget that paid for her teachers, technology and scholarships. The country had to borrow from different lenders, but the investment paid off. It led to growth, jobs and prosperity for its people, like Emma. It's when a country is burdened with unsustainable levels of debt that problems begin. Developing countries had a record $55 trillion in debt, even before COVID-19 hit. Debt sustainability is a growing concern as countries respond to the pandemic, struggling with urgent financing needs. Now, imagine Emma's life again. Her country borrows to fund an ambitious agenda, taking out loans from private creditors and others who are eager to lend. But the interest rates are high, and the amounts and terms of the loans are not transparent. This kicks off a cycle of mounting bills with less money to spend on projects, including education. Then the pandemic derails the budgets. Because the country now has a high debt burden, loans for regular citizens also come with high interest rates. Emma School never gets the extra investment in teachers and computers and she never learns to code. Without the scholarship, she misses the opportunity to attend college, she can't take out a loan, and never starts a business. Emma and her family stay poor. It's a story of unfulfilled potential that's all too common in many countries around the world. When countries can finance their future in a sustainable way and invest in their people, everyone wins. That's why debt matters for every single one of us. I'm Jill Diz Charkipova in Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings. Well, as Zainab explained, how governments manage debt is an issue that affects all of us well into our future. Many developing countries were struggling with debt even before COVID-19, but the pandemic has made a bad situation worse. Low-income countries in particular now face debt levels that simply aren't sustainable. World Bank Group President David Malpass invited three important thought leaders to share their ideas on how to better manage debt crises quickly and efficiently to get the world back on track for a resilient recovery. For the first in this series of flagship conversations on rethinking debt, he spoke to Angolan Finance Minister Vera Davez. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I'm here with our first guest, uh, Minister, uh, uh, Minister Davis de Sousa, uh, the Finance Minister, Angola. Vera, very nice to see you. Um, Angola has gone through a reprofiling of its debt. I wondered if you could describe the impact of debt on the people of Angola. Why was the pro reprofiling important? And some of the, how did it go? What were some of the challenges? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, President Malpaz. Thank you, David, for this opportunity, for being here and to share with you and with the audience, audience our experience. Uh, yes, we, 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 were, um, we were suffering the, the consequences of the, the pandemic. Of course, we were coming from uh, a starting point that were not easy. We were dealing with uh, recessions for so many years, and the pandemics just make it worse for 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 the, the Angolan economy. Uh, 
uh, and uh, as you know, uh, highly dependent on oil. So anything that affects the oil sector uh, hit us uh, very, very hardly. And that uh, reflects on our uh, stock of the debt because it reflects on the different indicators, the, the growth uh, decreased even more. Uh, our uh, international reserves decrease even more with impact on the exchange rate and impact on uh, the debt that is that were linked to the exchange rate. So a set of events uh, put us on a very stressful situation that uh, required from, from our side uh, to work on different, different fronts. Uh, on the revenue side, on the expenditure side, but also on the debt side. We, we got uh, important uh, assistance from, from institutions as World Bank and IMF. The, the G20, the DSSI initiative was very useful, uh, but also we talked with our main creditors to find a solution that uh, able us to, to have more breathing space on the medium term and to release these financial resources uh, to address the social social needs on health and, and on um, financial support uh, to the families. As you know, with your support, we are implementing a, a program to provide financial assistance to, to, to the families that are more vulnerable. So everything that give us uh, breathing space, that give us more financing uh, space to address the social needs of our population, uh, we, we are doing and, and we are doing with your help. Thank you. And, and so the, the, the stock of external debt went up from some 33 billion to over $50 billion. So it's a sizable amount. I wonder about the interest rate on that. And, what will happen? So you're you're having some temporary relief now. Does that run out? And and what will be the consequences? Or or what's the interest rate that you expect over over the coming decade? Yes, we we can look at the external uh, position and the the overall uh, picture of the debt. Regarding the external position, we increase almost 18 billion dollars since 2015 but if we look to the all the debt we will see that from 2017 to 2020 uh, we see a decrease from 8.8 billion to 68.8 billion so uh, we still uh, have uh, challenges to manage but we think we are on the right path especially because we are seeing since 2018 the gross financing needs also decreasing. We are being able to pay more expenditures with our tax collection. That is good news. Since 2018, 60% uh, of we we see 60 percent of reductions on our uh, gross financial uh, needs so i think we are on the right path we did well expanding the tax base uh, we we will need to keep working on improving the quality of expenditure and need to keep working on uh, building the confidence on the macroeconomic indicators on our, the commitment of the, gov of the government with the, 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 the reforms uh, to make sure that the, the, the perception of risk uh, uh, of the country decrease, that it's important also to decrease the, the interest rates. Uh, and, and we are also intending to, to continue negotiating with our multilateral par partners to get to give privilege on on concessional loans uh, to to address the financial needs that that we still to to, to address uh, but we really believe that uh, to 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 deal with all these uh, challenges in a sustainable way is to make sure that we diversify our economy, that we break uh, our dependency on oil, that we grow on a, an inclusive manner. Uh, 
to make sure that with that we see more jobs coming we see more tax collection coming and we also uh, increase our ability to to ask less financi financing lines even in concessional terms that we are able to collect more money to to fund our activities and if that happens the interest rates we will decrease so that that a medium term uh, goal but we need to keep working on that to make sure that in the short term with solutions like the common framework uh, that it's uh, it, that it's very that will be very useful we can deal this with the situation in the short term and in the medium term with the economy growing we can uh, be able to to to, to get access to, to more funds without increasing our dot stack, our stock, uh, our st um, the debt stock. Uh, very interesting. What a big part of your debt stock is the uh, is collateralized oil oil financing. But I, I I understood you to say that as you diversify the Angolan economy, I imagine it will be important how you can have um, uh, commercial bank financing for businesses. The you know the the shorter term kinds of financing. How is that going? Your relations with with commercial banks are they uh, are, are they staying engaged or is that a challenge as well? Uh, we, 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 uh, we feel that they still engage. Uh, we, we often receive a lot of proposals to finance specific projects. Uh, it's our initiative to, to say, calm down. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we want to prioritize, to, do, to give more importance to the private sector, to the direct investment. And uh, we want to take off our foot from the accelerator regarding uh, financial, financial lines. So yes, we feel that the commercial bank is still interested to, to, to give fi uh, financing uh, to, to Angola, but Angola wants to uh, move on with a strategy of combining, uh, getting, funds from the private sector to, to, to engage with us and, and participate with us on the grow, on the uh, uh, exploiting the opportunities, opportunities that we have in our country and to uh, uh, find funds uh, through concessional terms that sometimes are not acceptable, acceptable to commercial banks. So, uh, it's 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 a process that uh, in somehow is painful because it's it's a a, a, um, a different mindset and a different strategy that our some of our partners uh, um, start be start understanding but at the beginning was not easy to 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 negotiate on those terms but we still committed with that we still committed with the private investment we still committed with uh, getting financing on concessional terms and we are resisting uh, to 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 sign uh, contracts on commercial terms that we understand will add stress to to our uh, debt situation I, I understand. And so these are very challenging times for countries because of the pandemic, because of the slowdown in the global economy or, or worse, the deep recession for many countries. Uh, and then the challenge of, uh, of rebuilding into the future in ways that will make it all sustainable. So I, wa I want to really thank you for, uh, for, for, for j joining today uh, and uh, uh, good luck with all of the challenges facing Angola. Thank you, Vera. A big thank you to David and Minister Vera Davez for our first discussion. We've got lots more great speakers lined up, but now here's another chance for you to get involved. We're asking you to vote in our special poll, and we want to get a sense of how you're responding to the pandemic. So our question is, following the COVID-19 crisis, what is your biggest financial priority? Is it A, to save for the future, or B, make wise investments, or is your priority to C, take out a loan? Or lastly, will you be focusing on D, paying off debts? Now let's go through that one more time. Following the COVID-19 crisis, what is your biggest financial priority? 
Is it A, to save for the future? B, make wise investments? Is your priority to C, take out a loan? Or lastly, will you be focusing on D, paying off debts? You can cast your vote at live.worldbank.org. And my colleague Shri Shreeder and I will be revealing the results of the poll live at the end of this program. Now, as we heard earlier from Angola, governments today are grappling with how to finance their future development while also supporting their economies through the current crisis. Everyday citizens face similar challenges. We wanted to hear from you. How are you financing your future? How does your government's debt affect your ability to achieve your financial goals? Young leaders and entrepreneurs from all over the world sent us videos sharing their thought. Let's take a moment to hear what they have to say. If I could finance my future, I would pursue a graduate degree and invest in a home. If I could finance my future, I would keep on investing in my own business. I would be supporting more women entrepreneurs through my expanded business to empower themselves. I will be able to open my business which will provide my family a better lifestyle and income. I would travel as many places around the world. Haría crecer mi emprendimiento para dar trabajo a otras personas. I would have peace of mind in overcoming the current Lebanese economic crisis. I would get a student loan with a low interest rate in order to afford my MBA studies. Right now, my biggest financial goal is to save more. It's to pay off my student loans. To buy a home, a car, to save more and invest more. Now, in his first interview, President Malpass heard about the challenges facing Angola as it battles with the pandemic, while also dealing with a very heavy debt burden. For his second conversation, he wanted to hear from the private sector and how it's responding to this challenge. Julie Monaco is the managing director of City. Hi, I'm here with Julie Monaco, a managing director of Citibank. She has a wealth of experience, uh, decades in, in the field of uh, international finance. And I wanted to really explore uh, and understand better Citi's interaction as we explore the overall debt uh, crisis. So Julie, I know you're, a, you, you're an advisor to sovereigns, uh, or that's one of your roles. I wonder if you could go through the various roles or connections that Citibank uh, as a whole has with developing countries and especially with the poorest countries. So David, we at Citi are the largest provider of debt underwriting for the EM sovereigns around the world. Um, that is a, an area of um, great expertise and, and leadership from Citi for, for many, many decades. So we have tons of experience in working with sovereigns through restructurings. Uh, we have a sovereign rating advisory and a sovereign debt advisory team that gets involved with sovereigns that are facing debt distress. And we will work and we have had many, many years, my team, I should say, has, um, and the collective city team, has many years of experience of working in parallel with the IMF and with a sovereign and negotiating with private creditors. Most recently, we were in that position with the Ecuador restructuring. So as it relates to commercial, commercial bank lending, as you know, there is not a lot of traditional commercial bank lending from organizations like city or our peer institutions into the emerging market sovereigns. Um, that is because of what happened in the 80s and 90s. Most of the commercial lending that would go, uh, commercial bank lending that would happen with sovereigns um, is related to projects. Um, and, 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 and again, it's also tied to EIF type fund financing where there is high alignment with the official community. You know, our lending portfolio into sovereigns is mostly focused on, you know, FX lines, trade lines, as well as EAF, which is export agency finance backed um, lending from the official community where the private sector and the public sector are very much aligned in that type of lending. So that is very different. Um, and I think that that's the bank lending is very small compared to the overall official lending as well as the bonds um, market. That, that, that was great, and I, I, people are very interested in the details of that. So as you think about Ecuador, it faced in different types of debt, and, you, and, and they, they were able to reprofile uh, or restructure uh, some parts of that debt. How, 
how, do, how does the change in contracts affect the country's ability or the, the, the outcome of, the, of those discussions? For example, in terms of either collateral or in terms of uh, non-disclosure clauses, what's changed over recent years in that regard? The role that Citi played in Ecuador, we were an advisor along with an independent advisor. Um, we negotiated with the official creditors and we worked in parallel with the IMF and we worked with the bondholders. Um, and I think that um, I think that that situation, I think Ecuador is a perfect example that the current process can work. And that when you look at when you look at a situation where the bondholders are willing to take a haircut as they did, they are willing to do that when there is a level of transparency, when there is goodwill and um, the ability to show that there are going to be changes and reforms and, and they get confidence in the data on how the country is going to move forward. I think we've seen time and time again, David, that um, you know there's been 17 Paris Club restructurings since 2010. 12 of those involved mandatory inclusion of bondholders and bondholders are very willing to come to the table and um, and and restructure debt as long as there is that one is that because of the way the more and more uptake of collective um, action clauses um, has made it easier to make those structurings happen on the bond side also what you have is just in expectation i think that there it's understood in the bond markets that this type of restructuring is part of this asset class in the em um, and so i think that there's a level of acceptance there but it also requires goodwill around um, how that restructuring gets done it's 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 different the bank the me mechanism for restructuring the commercial bank debt is very different than the than the bond debt and as you know in ecuador we restructured Ecuador. The bondholders took a cut, but there was nobody touched the official debt under that restructuring. And I actually, in preparation to talking to you about the um, the benefits of the G20 Common Framework, I actually asked my team, would the would that framework have changed anything about how we approach the restructuring in Ecuador? And the answer I got back was that potentially the G20 framework, because you have all the official creditors at the table um, and key official creditors that are not under the table under the Paris Club, like China, that potentially it could have um, it's, it could have sped up some of the negotiations on the official side. Let's stay on. Thank you for, for all of that. Uh, let's stay on the uh, common framework. Uh, so it's it's aimed at at uh, countries in in debt distress uh, and uh, countries that are that are that are uh, lower income than 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 uh, Ecuador. Um, it will it, 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 and so the constructive part that you described that it brings together Paris Club creditors, the non Paris Club official creditors, and also the private sector. So we're working currently with Chad, with Ethiopia, with Zambia, who have a requested common framework treatment. How do you see that playing out? Will it, will it work, I wonder? Yeah, um, I think, you know, it certainly has the potential to work. And I think theoretically, um, the common framework does make it better because, but, it, but there's conditions to that, right? There has to be better transparency um, and, and, and there has to be complete transparency to build that goodwill. And again, you have to look at, you know, does it work um, and how you're defining does it work? You have to, you know, the debt principle that we go into these restructurings with, with any sovereign is you want to maintain as best you can access to commercial credit and to, you know, to market credit after the restructuring, right? Uh, you know, for, for entities for entities that are on the lower end of the income that do not, you know, that have lost, if a, if, a, if a sovereign has already in such a dire situation that they've already experienced market exclusion, um, then, then obviously this type of, this type of restructuring under the G20 framework um, is, is something that, that is gonna help them, right? They're, they have nothing to lose by, by going through this type of framework. I think where we have to be careful with the framework is around sovereigns that may have um, a decent economy, 
they have the ability to reprofile the debt in a way that allows them not to lose access right um, to either bank credit or to the, the capital markets and that's what we want to make sure and that's why we're we're very encouraged i just want to say one statement is that we are very encouraged by the way the g20 and the paris club has engaged the private sector on the g20 framework and we believe that's going to be critical to make sure that it works um, in terms of having the private sector at the table early. Julie, how, how do you think about the short term versus long term trade offs for countries? You, you could think about it as a liquidity problem versus the longer term sustainability or solvency uh, issues that the, the people of the country face. Are those incentives all in line? It, it seems to me that creditors have a large incentive to see to see the liquidity problem solved, meaning the short run problem, and then maybe do it again. You mentioned all of the, the high number of uh, Paris Club reschedulings uh, that, are, that have already been underway. Yeah, I think that in terms of the trade-offs, you're trading off immediate relief with long-term access and, and the funding growth needed, right? So when you think about how a country that goes through that process is going to have to balance that against their desire to finance their SDGs and and all of that. And there's not going to be enough official money to do that. So I think that the trade offs that you're constantly trying to balance when you go through one of these negotiations is how to do it in a way that doesn't cut off a country from the additional private sector funding that's going to be needed um, for them, you know, because there's, you know, there's, you know, there, as we know, there's trillions of dollars a gap. Um, that the private sector have to fill on helping these countries achieve their SDGs. So you don't want to be in a situation where they don't have access to funding. Now you have to look at the, like I said, the bond market, the mechanism of the bond market and the bank market are very different. On the bank side, if the bank, if commercial banks are forced to take a restructuring, that is going to have long-term implications for the country because credit committees, regulatory constraints, is go, it are, it's one of the reasons why there's very little traditional commercial credit from large institutions like Citi, right, right now. So you see that, um, that, that there is long tail risk associated with forcing commercial bank restructuring. So you have to be very careful on that. And there's also implications where it's not just the lending that gets impacted, it's the FX lines, it's the trade lines. Um, and other impacts. So you have to be, um, so I think when we say under the framework, and I think the devil's in the details that everything has to be done on an equal basis. Um, if we apply the same methodology to the bondholders that we do to commercial bank credit, that's not necessarily gonna work because they're very different mechanism and very different considerations that we have to take when we're advising. And one final question, uh, does collateral, some more of the lending has been done w with collateral and also with non, non-disclosure clauses in it by, by yeah. not, not by city, but by others. Um, does that change the dynamic of the reprofiling or of the restructuring? Yes, yes. So I think that when we talk about the transparency principles, um, disclosures of liabilities are key. And what we're seeing is that there are, you know, indirect pledges of central bank reserves, um, even the bank's own ownership of its, uh, the, their own bank repo agreements, um, their long-term commercial uh, commitments um, with set-offs, right? And that's very common with countries that are oil exporting countries and have SOEs that are oil companies. So those, those are points of concern. And I think that we have to figure out through the transparency principles, those are not considered as you know, they're not included in the transparency requirements and we have to move to get there. And I think one of the one of the most um, I, th I think we at City have very much been a supporter of the transparency principles that the IF has put forward in 2019. Um, I think a lot of great solutions to transparency were in the World Bank report that you did in the fall. Um, you know, and I think that we need to we need to address these transparency issues if we're going to get there, because it, it is problematic as you go into these. And I, and I can tell you that there's it's a forensics exercise to get access to all this information when you're doing a restructuring. 
And without going into the details, I can tell you that it was a forensic exercise as we approached it um, in Ecuador, and it will be the same thing in other countries. So I think the IIF has recently gotten um, um, the I sorry the IIF recently has asked the OECD to take implementing the transparency principles because they've been out there for a few years. They haven't really been taken up, and if the OECD gets backing from the G20 and it's actually implemented and we build upon that, I think that's going to be critically important to make these restructurings work better. Th thank you very much, Julie. Very interesting conversation. I appreciate it. I'm Eric Kegelin in Lome, Togo, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meeting. A reminder that President Malpass will be joining us again to answer your questions in a special live show following this event, so be sure to stick around. And in the meantime, you can upvote your favorite question at live.worldbank.org. That's also where our experts are already answering your questions in English, Arabic, Spanish, and French on our live chat. That's all at live.worldbank.org. And if you've just joined us, welcome. I'm Paul Blake, and you're watching our spring meetings event on rethinking debt. Now, it's fair to say that in this debt crisis, children are among those hardest hit. Kevin Watkins, chief executive officer of Save the Children, knows from experience how debt crises can hurt future generations. He joined President Malpass for the final segment in today's series of conversations on rethinking debt. Hello, I'm here with Kevin Watkins. Kevin, you've been involved in development for a long time, for, for decades. I wonder if you have reflections on debt itself and how it interacts with countries. What are your thoughts in general? Thanks, David, and, and great to be here with you. Well, I, I think my most immediate reflection is, you know, when I look back to when I started in Oxfam, which was back in the early 1990s, it was really at the tail end of what had been a lost decade for Latin America and what was the start of the uh, a second lost decade for sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, debt wasn't the only problem driving these lost decades for, the, for some of the poorest parts of the world, but it was a significant part. And looking back on that episode now, I think there are a couple of lessons that have an important bearing on the work that the World Bank and you personally are leading, which is, first of all, a mistake was made both in Latin America and in Africa, which was to treat what was a solvency problem as a liquidity problem. And so we had a succession of failed initiatives until, in the case of the low-income countries, we had the HIPIC initiative which of course the bank played a central uh, part in framing and driving through. But it really took us the best part of two decades to solve the problem. And I think the second lesson that comes out of that period is that it's really critical that all creditors participate in solving the problem. And again, there were a lot of delays in those early stages of getting all creditors together and to treat debt in a coherent way. And of course, there was a lack of transparency in the system. For many countries, it was just very difficult to work out where the debt was held uh, and how much debt was held by who. When you say solvency and liquidity, so liquidity is looking at the shorter term and recognizing that the country is out of cash and solvency is the idea of how do you have sustainable debt. And so do you think the, 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 uh, the system has improved over these decades? Are we in a better position now to tackle that specific dichotomy that the temptation of creditors is to say, well, as long as I get paid over the next three years, I should be okay versus the, the longer term goals of the country are to have children grow up with enough food, with enough uh, health care. Uh, how are, are we in a better place now? Well, I, I think that's a great question. And you're quite right to draw attention to the human dimension of this. What concerned me most about debt when I was working in Oxfam back in the 90s and the early 2000s was the impact that it was having in diverting investment 
that could have been going into nutrition, into education, into child health, to creditors in a way that was holding back the progress of, of countries. Now, as to whether the system is more transparent and clearer now than it was back in those days, I think that's an open question because if you look at what happened after HIPIC, of course, a lot of money was saved, about uh, just under 2% of GDP actually for the, for the 37 countries covered on average. A lot of that money did go into healthcare and education. But unfortunately, many of the countries that benefited from the HIPIC initiative off the back of the commodities boom that um, happened after 2007, uh, started taking on credit on terms which we now look back and say was probably not affordable in the case of a lot of sovereign debt. And in the case of debt that was incurred in particular from China was very non-transparent. This was debt that was often collateralized against productive assets, much of which was held off the books as it were in parastatal enterprises. And we're now coming to terms with the fact that even before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, about half of countries eligible for either lending were either back in debt distress or in danger of falling back into debt distress. And so I fear not enough lessons were learned from that earlier period of debt. And it's absolutely critical that we now do take on board those lessons as we work to make the debt sustainability initiative work. One of the um, one of the lessons is the need for transparency, for much deeper uh, understanding of what the contracts are, what the terms are, what the collateral might be. We're working hard on that at the at the World Bank, including our international debt statistics uh, system, to have it have more scope and to uh, include more types of debt because the the creditors uh, are are quite skillful at finding ways that uh, that d debt can doesn't count in the statistics and yet it still still bears a burden. So I think we can make progress on transparency, but there still is a tendency or there is an increasing tension, tendency to have non-disclosure clauses and collateral, as you say, which makes it all difficult. Um, at the core of the G20 common framework is the idea of, uh, of, of trying to have comparable treatment for all creditors. And one of the challenges, and I wonder if you'll comment, is on the makeup of the international uh, financial system or the, the legal structure. Um, is it given, is, is, is there really a way to have comparable treatment that includes private sector creditors? Well, I think it's absolutely critical, David, that private sector creditors are part of the deal here. And, you know, both in the common framework and actually in the DSSI framework, it's absolutely clear that the expectation is that all creditors will participate in providing uh, debt relief and supporting the moratorium. You know, the, the reality is you just have to look at the simple arithmetic of debt servicing, that the Paris Club which is the main group of creditors that have provided debt relief so far, account for something uh, in the order of six and a half billion in debt servicing. Uh, China and private creditors account for something in the order of over 35 billion. So if we don't have private creditors participating, if we don't have China participating, we're not gonna be able to provide the support that countries so desperately need as they try to adjust to the fiscal crisis that they're now in. Yeah, that's a huge shift from your early days in the in the 1990s of uh, it, it, the, the Paris Club used to be one of the big players within the credit, but you're saying six billion versus 35 billion of debt service. So there's a, it's become lopsided the other way. That used to be in the 1980s, uh, the, the commercial banks uh, had a big chunk of the debt. Uh, that's, that's less so the case now. So we have different problems. Well, um, do, it, do, Kevin, do you have other, um, I, I mean, any direct advice that you that you want to give to the international community on the debt problem? Is it a big problem, and what could be done? One or two things that would make it make it move along in a better direction than in the past. 
Well, I'd, I think I'd have two propositions to put on that. So the, the first is that it's very clear that for a large group of countries, that debt servicing is now compromising the ability of governments to provide basic services for some of their most vulnerable citizens and for children. I mean, to give one illustration of the problem, there are about 35 countries who are covered by the DSSI initiative who are currently spending more on debt servicing than they're spending on health. This is at a time when child malnutrition is rising, when child poverty is rising, when we have evidence from the World Bank that education budgets are being cut very deeply as, as governments respond to fiscal pressures. So surely this is an opportunity for the world to come together on behalf of children and to convert what are essentially unpayable debt liabilities in many cases into investments in human capital and in particular capital and support for children to make sure that they get the education, the nutrition, the decent health that they have a right to. The second point I would make is that in order for this initiative to work, and we really appreciate your leadership, David, in driving this initiative, it is critical that all creditors participate. It's simply not acceptable for sovereign bondholders to sit on the sidelines, to hide behind opaque deals, and to assume that they have some sort of exemption ticket from their moral responsibilities and their obligations towards the countries in question. So we would really like to see all creditors participating. Uh, you know, we know from the experience of Bolivia that when private creditors step up and provide relief, it can actually improve the credit rating of countries and it can certainly improve the financial sustainability prospects. So I, I think, David, they would be my two primary recommendations. Thank you. That's a, that's a great uh, conclusion. Kevin, thank you very much for uh, your insights. Uh, good luck and all. Thank you so much, David. Good to see you. I am Mampunza Estar in Uganda and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meeting. And a big thank you to President Malpass and all of his guests today. Let's remind you of the poll we're running throughout this event. We're asking you to vote at live.worldbank.org. And the question is, following the COVID-19 crisis, what is your biggest financial priority? Is it A, to save for the future? Or B, make wise investments? Or is your priority to C, take out a loan? Or lastly, will you be focusing on D, paying off debts? You can cast your vote at live.worldbank.org. That's also where you can dive deeper into some of the issues raised by our guests. We've put together a list of reports, blogs, and briefs so you can learn more about the topics we're discussing today. Now it's time to turn to our final discussion. This debt crisis is unprecedented because it's linked to a global pandemic. But it sure isn't the first time that the world has confronted this challenge. In fact, there have been reoccurring cycles of debt in many parts of the world throughout history. I'm joined today by two experts to discuss what we can learn from this experience to chart a better course for permanent debt reduction. Carmen Reinhart is the World Bank Group Chief Economist, and K.Y. Amaako is the president of the African Center for Economic Transformation. Welcome to you both. Carmen, let me start with you. You've studied financial crises over the past 800 years. What's different about this crisis? Well, the list is really too long to, to go over, but let me highlight a couple. I, I mean, it started as a health crisis, did, didn't have its roots in a financial bubble or financial uh, driven. It's, it's a pandemic. Uh, because it's a pandemic, one of the exceptional things about this crisis is that it's really hit everyone. The synchronicity in output declines in 2020 is something you have not seen historically. Another feature that makes it very different from the 2008-2009 crisis, it's that it's a very regressive crisis. It's regressive within countries hitting the poorest uh, within countries, households, smaller firms, and across countries. 
Uh, this is different from 2008, 2009, where you know a big focal point of the crisis were about a dozen advanced economies. Now the low-income countries, the emerging markets are are really disproportionately hurting. Okay, well, let's talk about some of those emerging economies. You know, over the years, Africa has been hit by cycles of debt buildups and then crises. You've seen the setbacks when budgets become tight and payment difficulties become the greatest concern. How are people and development programs affected during those crises? Yeah, the first point I would like to make is that debt build, build ups and crises are accompanied by high debt payments which naturally restricts the fiscal space to respond. When countries are in debt distress or a debt crisis, they spend their limited finances to pay interest rather than to invest in human capital, develop critical infrastructure, and facilitate economic growth and job creation. As a result, countries already struggling to transform their economies and invest in their people suffer further setbacks. Let me put it in the context of Africa that I know best. Our growing young population requires governments to invest in education, skills, and job creation. But with increasing debt payments and an economic downturn, the amount of money that countries can invest is reduced. As a result, there's a severe risk will be adding another generation of poorly educated and unskilled young people to the ones we already have. Because we are spending our limited resources on debt repayments and social protection for the most vulnerable. This in Africa will substantially, it seems to me, affect our ability to, to transform our growing youth population into the growing democratic dividend that we are looking for. So as I see it, by 2020, we all know this, Africa will have more people entering the labor market than any world region. If they are not gainfully employed, we will have social and political unrest. So it seems to me we need a robust solution. We are laying the foundations. Without a robust solution, we'll be laying the foundation for, for exacerbating the potential risks associated with these challenges. So it's real. Let's talk about some of those solutions. And um, you know, you're talking about some of the risks involved. Carmen, I know you've been stressing the need for quick debt resolution. Are there examples where decisive debt reduction worked and, and led to better economic conditions? And, and in particular, what about in the emerging market, uh, emerging markets crises of the 1980s to 2000s? Well, so there are examples of quick resolutions, but they tend to be unfortunately, of the more isolated, idiosyncratic variety, uh, meaning, you know, a country that was hit by a natural disaster and it was able to quickly renegotiate with its creditors. But the, when you ask me about the 1980s, a big takeaway from the 1980s is precisely we don't want to repeat that. Um, for the very reasons that KY uh, uh, alluded to, um, you know, the, the burden of having resources devoted to debt servicing at a time in which resource needs uh, to recover from the pandemic crisis are so dire, this highlights the importance of debt relief. But what am I afraid of right now? I'm afraid of that so far. Uh, the move in that direction uh, is very, very slow. Uh, we have not seen uh, private creditor participation in DSSI uh, as yet. And, you know, if history is any guide, unfortunately, the creditors uh, will also move slowly in granting debt relief. Uh, so, and we have a much more complex creditor base today than we did in the 1980s. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, countries have bondholders, a variety of private creditors, 
a, a, a broader array of official creditors. It's complicated. So the need for speedy debt reduction is, is clearly there. Uh, but as I said, you know, the problem historically has been a uh, very slow movement on the creditor side. I think more transparency, something that the bank has been really working uh, very uh, assiduously from, from, for some time to increase transparency of, of debt and credits and, and terms of borrowing and so on can increase uh, the, the creditor coordination and speed things along. Um, it won't solve the issues, but it, it may help speed things up. And, and KY, Carmen was just talking there about the changing creditor base. And I've been reading a, a little bit about this um, diversifying creditor base with, with private creditors increasing their share. Tell us a little bit about why that is a challenge and, and how countries in Africa are dealing with this new challenge. Are there any lessons that can be learned from past experiences to improve debt management today? Yeah, I think both you and Carmen are very correct that the debt situation is a lot more complex. I think that's the first place we all agree. But we also agree that it's in everybody wants interest that Africa transforms. As I said, with our growing population, we must spend more on infrastructure, education, urbanization. We need smart agriculture, we need smart technology, and we need smart people. But we see that over the years, so the last two decades, China, for example, has emerged as the biggest bilateral lender to Africa, transferring nearly $150 billion. In addition, there's much more private sector debt, and Russia and Middle Eastern states are becoming big lenders to Africa. These new players often, as it says, operate by rules that may seem less transparent. That's a fact. Make it more difficult to understand the scale of the problem. So capacity across the continent to manage debt is more robust, it seems to me, than it was in the 1990s. But after the COVID crisis, several African countries are facing debt distress or a debt crisis. But as you say, we need to learn from the past. In fact, I've just written a book where I, about African development called, if you know the beginning where well, the end shall not trouble you from an African proverb. So we need to learn lessons from the past to inform the future. <laughs> That's the essence of what I'm trying to say. So, so what are some of the, first, national and regional debt problems are not individual events for countries with temporary liquidity shortages. They will over time have significant repercussions for global financial stability. That's one lesson. Second, negotiating ad hoc solutions with different borrowers does not work. Any solution developed must work for all lenders, official and commercial. Third point I'll make is that the process, as Carmen said, must be transparent, covering any new financing, its sources, and the framework for subsequent transactions between parties. Fourth and finally, by pursuing an agreed strong policy reform program at the country level, putting new money in the game and giving creditors, creditors re-exit options. If you do so, uncertainty can be minimized and investor confidence restored. So, so those are some of the lessons that I think are applicable to our situation today. And Carmen, three countries have applied so far for debt relief under the G20 Common Framework for Debt treatment, Treatments. Now, for those of us who might not be aware, can you tell us briefly what that is? And then can you talk to us about whether in your assessment, this is a step in the right direction in shaping debt restructuring going forward? So first of all, uh, let's start out with the debt suspension uh, uh, initiative, the DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. We were dealt, we have a once in a hundred year pandemic. You know, this is a, an exceptional shock as we've already discussed. Um, so the DSSI was primarily designed with 
the view that uh, during the pandemic, countries would be far better off diverting resources away from debt servicing to deal with the health uh, and social emergency and, and the social needs uh, with the pandemic. But it's a temporary solution. Uh, and it was designed as a temporary solution. Now, KY has already you know, alluded to this. Uh, even before COVID, a significant share of countries were either in debt distress or in a high um, likelihood of debt distress. Since COVID, that number has increased. So the common framework moves from the recognition that these problems are temporary to that the problems are more structural, that that debt reduction of one form or another is needed. And by debt reduction, it can take many forms. It can be, you know, face value reductions, or it could be lengthening maturities and giving better lending terms. Uh, it can be, it could take a variety of forms. That's not what we're discussing here. But the main point is that you need debt, debt, debt reduction in net present value terms, which is something beyond the DSSI. Um, and, and KY, I also, and, and I also mentioned the issue of transparency. Right now, I think a very important driver of how quickly um, the common framework can move forward in the cases of Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia, the three countries that have applied, importantly, relies on creditors being able to get together and work something out. And for creditors to be able to work something out, you need transparency. And NSKY, uh, you know, has noted, um, you know, we have a lot of new entrants uh, into the creditor pool. And, and you know, so, so it, it will be a challenge. I will conclude by saying it's a step in the right direction. Uh, it, it, it opens the door to the recognition that the, the problems are bigger than a temporary uh, pandemic. Uh, and, you know, um, but in these things, I always say the devil is in the details. So we'll see how, how you know, how uh, creditors can, can coordinate to produce a good outcome uh, for the countries that have applied. Okay, well, let's just get the final thought from you. What can the international community do to reach a more permanent solution? Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> but I think let's start with the DSSI that Carmen has uh, just mentioned. It's a step in the right direction, but it's not sufficient. And then, so we need to build upon that. I think in the first stage, we need to extend it to the end of 2020 to give countries more fiscal space to keep investing in the priorities that I've already mentioned. And then there are obviously the issue of a common framework and how we work on that. So this is a first step, but how do we deepen that going forward? So I very much agree with what Carmen has said on that. We also need to develop innovation solutions to the current debt challenge so that they respond to diverse needs of borrowers and lenders. Uh, my, from my colleagues at the Economic Commission for Africa, where I, which I headed before, have been arguing, for example, that we need to acknowledge, come up with a fairer rating system for African borrowers, borrowing countries. For example, they indicate Greece has a worse debt to GDP ratio than Ghana, but Greece can borrow at less than 2%. There's at least 4.5% for Ghana. So the whole international rating system and how African countries can assess the market is also an issue that they've been talking about. At the request of the African finance ministers in their meeting at Addis Ababa, only a few days ago, the ministers came up with a recommendation that the SDR IMF should create up to $650 billion worth of SDRs and to establish an on-lending mechanism for G7 countries to transfer their SDRs to shares, SDR shares to low and middle income countries. That's a specific recommendation 
from African finance ministers. I'm glad that only yesterday, I believe, the managing director of the IMF has indicated she is committed to recommending to her board the creation of additional SDRs. I think it's the kind of innovative solutions we need. But we should not just focus on debt, and that's my main point. If Africa is to achieve, reclaim the loss to COVID in terms of meeting our SDG goals in the decade ahead, we must transform our economies at a faster pace than we have been so far. I think it goes beyond that. It's about transformation and to transform African countries like countries everywhere, everywhere must borrow. But to ensure that this borrow is manageable, it must be affordable to ensure we can repay our debts. So these are the fundamental issues that I want to put on the table in the long term. KY Emawako and Carmen Reinhardt, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Now, we've heard a lot about how much debt and financing can help or hinder a resilient recovery in developing countries. The way countries handle their borrowing today will determine whether they can achieve their development goals tomorrow and into the future. It will also weigh heavily on the financial hopes and dreams of citizens everywhere, especially youth. Now, throughout this event, we've been hearing from young global leaders, and let's hear from them once more. In five years, I hope that I can buy a home for my parents. I hope that I would have recovered resources that I lost due to the government defaulting on its debt. I hope that I am living debt-free and financially stable. I hope that I am able to give access to financing to 100 people of my generation from emerging countries. Espero poder tener una casa propia y sentirme más cómoda manejando mi presupuesto. I hope that I would start a family and get on the Aggie 100 list to travel to the countries that I have never traveled to and uh, consider saving up for cash for any kind of emergency situations. The current financial system doesn't work for me. Let's fix it. The current financial system doesn't work for me. Let's fix it. El actual sistema financiero no funciona para mí. Vamos a cambiarlo. Let's fix it. Khalina Salho. Let's fix it. Let's fix it. Let's fix it. So great to hear all of those positive hopes for the future. Now we're only halfway through this week's events. And if you want to share your thoughts on any aspect of our spring meetings, you can use the hashtag resilient recovery. Now, please don't go anywhere. The show continues live from the World Bank Group headquarters, where my colleague Srimathy Sridhar is standing by with World Bank Group President David Malpass. We'll be looking at your questions, your comments, revealing the results of today's poll, and much more. And we're live once more from the World Bank Group headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm Srimathi Sridhar, and over the next half hour or so, we'll hear from youth in Japan, Lesotho, and Nigeria on their hopes for a COVID-19 recovery. We'll also reveal the results of our poll and speak to our country directors in India and Benin about the climate challenges and action taking place in those countries. But first, to get his thoughts, I'm delighted to be joined by World Bank Group President David Malpass. David, it's so nice to see you again. Thanks for being here. Hi, Sri. Good to be here. So we've gotten a lot of great questions over the past few weeks on the role debt can play in helping countries recover from the pandemic. So let's get started with this first question. It was sent to us on video by Ibuka Orijakor in Nigeria. Let's take a look. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Christian Ibuka Orijakor. So the big question, the question here is how does debt affect development? Does debt promote development or detest development? Or can debt be a double-edged sword? Thank you. So how does debt affect development? What would you tell Ibuka, David? Yeah, and these are really interesting topics that people have been discussing today, and that's a, that's a critical one. It is a double-edged sword. If you, if you borrow and don't have a good purpose for it, it's going to come back because you have to pay debt service, you have to repay the debt, and you won't get what you want out of the debt. But on the other hand, for developing countries, for, for everyone really, debt can be an important part of a growth initiative. You can, you can fund health initiatives, you can fund 
very importantly, new businesses. So if we think of development, uh, there should be more and more debt. And that's we're trying to create that with some of our transparency initiatives. If, if the people of the country know what their governments are borrowing and there's some transparency of the contracts, what's the interest rate on the contract, what's the purpose of the contract, that helps a lot. And you know, it works also on the investment side, meaning what are we getting for our money? Uh, will it be useful to the community? Will it be useful to the nation? And what really is the plan for using this debt capacity of the country? I think those are valid, relevant questions. Mm -hmm. And we're right now in a, at a point in the world where some of the countries are over indebted. There's an unsustainable amount of debt. So that's a big challenge that we're working on. So understanding how debt affects development now, let's bring in the youth perspective. We have a question online from Tara, who wants to know what youth can do in their communities to create more awareness around debt and debt financing. Huh. Well, that can apply to lots of things. What can they do to be more engaged in health in, in education? Uh, and I think to engage in institutions and to help build stronger institutions, ones that, for example, a, a starting point for a lot of countries is, do you know which government officials have the authority to, uh, to authorize debt or to commit the country uh, to debt or the community? It works at really all levels of government. And so I think young people can be engaged be educated about the about finance about what's an interest rate how does it work and then how do you get involved in the institutions of your country too because the goal is to have debt used in ways that really help development so that that means engage in how do you, who makes the decisions on when a, there can be a debt contract how did they decide what to invest in and how do you get good use out of all of that I think there's should be a lot of engagement and that starts frankly with a lot of education about about what are the goals of your country? How does it interact with health and education and climate? Uh, what, what do you want as a nation? Those are all questions I think that are really important. So a lot of ways for youth to be proactive and education is key there. Um, this next online question is about negative interest rates. This online viewer wants to know how do they work and can they be uh, a solution for the world's poorest? Uh, you know, economists have been trying to figure that out. So for some years now, there's been this question of why is inflation as low as it is, given the amount of growth in central bank balance sheets. So, you know, these are questions that we probably can't resolve, figure out right now. But negative interest rates are, are in, in one way to think about them, is they're the result of institutional success over 50 years where central banks had and, and budgets uh, of countries had some kind of discipline. And so then you get to the point where you can borrow at a very low interest rate or even a negative interest rate. The, the, a challenge with that is, you get to do that, people get to do that once in a generation maybe, uh, because you're borrowing from future generations at a very lower and negative interest rate, uh, and, and therefore you're going to need to repay that debt. And so the country the, or the, the borrowing authority, sometimes it might be a municipality, even a city, uh, needs to make really good use of the debt or of the borrowing it, because you're going to have to pay it back and you don't get to do it over and over again. There'll be a period of years maybe where the world enjoys this super low interest rate. One challenge for development is the developing countries themselves don't get to fully participate in this. You know, the interest rates have fallen for the advanced economies, mm -hmm. but very few of the developing countries uh, have gotten as much benefit from that. So there's uh, an inherent unfairness in this, in that people that already had uh, some, some national wealth are getting the low interest rate. And so that is, I think, a challenge. We want to address that as the World Bank with good practices in the developing countries. If there can be transparency, good choice of projects, uh, th that can help the country get lower interest rates. Right. Um, now, this next question comes from Ngugi Urungu in Kenya, and he wants to know if there are models of financing public projects that ensure governments can repay debts comfortably. Emphasis on 
comfortably. So, uh, you know, the way to do that is if you get a really good return from your project. So if I have a public-private par partnership, uh, pa uh, partnership or investment that's well chosen, and so Kenya has huge challenges with uh, transportation and with agriculture. So choose projects that really have a payoff, then you can afford the debt service and, and do it comfortably. That gets into this institutional structure of how did you, how did you decide on the, the projects that your country wants to undertake. Um, this gets into all these challenges of urban and city planning. World Bank's very involved in those because as cities get bigger and bigger, they need to make investments that will help people be able to get to work, do it in an environmentally friendly way uh, that uh, w will help people save time by not having to Tra travel for hours and hours a day. One of the successful World Bank projects has been in cities where they're, they're, they have um, mountainous areas or bad bad roads into the city, mm -hmm. putting a putting an aerial tram car or some kind of mass transit in can really help people get to work in fewer hours per day and that saves them. So how do you create a public-private investment that can do the right things at the time that it's needed? These are uh, challenges, we call them, or I, I think of them as governance challenges. Mm -hmm. Do you have a city council that makes good decisions? Who's involved? How do they, how do they disclose what the decisions, you know, a, a big part of this, I think, is the transparency that's needed so that people know how did a decision get made and what was the, what was the evidence? What was the basis for the decision? That can really help get us to good decision making. Sure, this is actually a great segue into my next and last question, which is about debt transparency. So one of our online viewers says, you know, debt transparency is obviously critical for impact, but COVID-19 has changed that and how has it changed it? And how can we overcome this huge economic and financial hurdle as we look to recover? Yeah, so w w one of the challenges is working from home, and that's happening in countries around the world it, with different degrees of success. Some countries don't, don't have electricity access for a lot of the people, and so it's very hard to then be working from home. Also in the informal sector, a lot of workers are left out. They don't get a social safety net, uh, and they, there's not the concept of working from home. You have to be at the job. And so this, this has created uh, challenges. So we think of them in the advanced economies as uh, one of transparency or how con connectivity, how do you really get uh, connected? I think for a lot of the poor countries, it's more of a survival question, a nutrition, a food insecurity question uh, that are very pressing needs. You know, one of the harmful aspects of the COVID crisis is kids getting left out of school because they fall backward in their education. They may not get the vaccinations that they need. The schools may have been one of the systems that gave them uh, food, that gave them uh, nutritious food during the day. And so these are all, so I, I, I think in terms of transparency, we can also add in digitalization or having data that helps uh, countries and governments know where they need to put resources. World Bank works extensively in those areas of trying to have data and surveys that are meaningful to people in countries so that they can, uh, so that they can make, make progress. All that's been made harder by COVID. Uh, and so uh, we, we, I think, need to really work urgently toward that recovery on the other side of COVID. Can I say a final word on va vaccinations and transparency are important? Who's been able to get vaccinations? We, we, the World Bank has uh, extensive programs now. We'll have 50 countries with financing available for vaccines. And that means some system of keeping track who's gotten vaccinated so that people aren't aren't mistakenly getting vaccinated twice or more than they need to, uh, but also how do you get full coverage to uh, those people that want it and uh, that are most vulnerable, how do you do that? And that can be an aspect of digitalization and of transparency. 
Yeah, the COVID-19 has changed so much for us here. So it's really uh, great to hear about how debt transparency is still a priority for us. David, with that, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today and for telling us more about the role debt can play in helping countries build a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. Super, Sri. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody. I'm glad people are interested in these topics. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Mariana Serati in Brasilia, Brazil, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Readings. Now, throughout these spring meetings, we're highlighting the voices and perspectives of youth leaders and thinkers around the world. For the past few weeks, we've been collecting video submissions from hundreds of young people. We asked them about the role that they and their peers could play in a resilient recovery. Today, we hear from Jin in Japan, Mapaseka in Lesotho, and Benjamin and Anthony, both from Nigeria. I believe an establishment of a national youth council is a strategy for resilient recovery plan from COVID-19. A national youth council is a platform for youth to be part of processes, decision making and hold leaders accountable. For a resilient recovery from the pandemic, the youth should use their various social media platforms to promote good information about the COVID-19 vaccine. This will help to reduce vaccine hesitancy that is very common among the Nigerian population today. With massive broad vaccination coverage, we can begin to release our foot off the pedal of some of the interventions like restrictions, lockdown that is hurting directly or indirectly hurting the economy. I believe that young people can contribute in the new jobs created by public projects and at building green infrastructure will lead to a resilient recovery. Reach out to young people considering factors such as sex, age, and gender. Putting diversity at the center, leveraging the agency of young people in the context of information technology, social media, and networking is the way to go. The youth will be able to advocate for implementation of policies that help women-owned businesses that have been affected to be resuscitated, policies that foster youth employment, policies that tackle technological gaps that are visible in rural communities that hinder education. We are in an era whereby a whole lot of jobs has gone obsolete and new ones are springing up. They are springing up with different new skill set requirements. The youth should endeavor to engage in skill acquisition that will make them more employable. This will help to reduce the high, high rates of unemployment in the country today. In addition to that, government should make credit facilities, loans easily accessible to the youth. This will encourage business startups and SMEs that will directly boost the GDP. Listen to young people. Young people of the 21st century have a language. It is necessary, crucial and pertinent for governments across the world to ask the question, what is the language of young people? Hello, I'm Naida Lai Manosa in Ventian Lao PDR, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meeting. And my colleague Paul Blake now joins us in the World Bank Group headquarters. Paul, let's talk polls. We've been running them all this week for each of our events. So what was today's question? Yeah, that's right. We have a different poll each day. Today's poll is following the COVID-19 crisis. What is your biggest financial priority? And the options are save for the future, make wise investments, take out a loan, or pay off debts. And here's how everyone's voting. In first place, 55.8% of the vote goes to make wise investments. 27.3% of the vote goes for Save for the Future. That's coming in second place. Third place is paying off debt. That's 11.8% of the vote. And finally, taking out a loan, 5.1% of folks say that is their biggest financial priority after the COVID-19 pandemic has abated. Okay. Yeah. I was a bit surprised by that. I was a little surprised by it. Although I, I would have thought paying off debts, but that's my, my own personal one. You've got some student loans that I need to pay off. Of course, so yeah. That'll be, that, that'll be my priority for sure. I thought that would be a little higher up. I personally voted for save for the future, um, yeah. which maybe I can argue that I think that's making a wise investment. Yeah, which There's some the overlap. There. There's some overlap. <laughs> but yeah, it's good. I mean, if you save for the future, you know, in, in next crisis or, or anything that comes along, you'll, you'll have a little more cushion. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, so. thanks for that, Paul. For sure, for sure.
Now, all this week, we've been speaking with country directors and managers around the world on their climate challenges and the actions they've been taking in their countries. Today, we head to India. And it's from New Delhi that I spoke to country director J Junaid Ahmad, and I asked him what a resilient recovery looks like in the world's second most populous country. Well, that's a very tough question you ask, but a very important one. I think there are two aspects to what a resilient recovery looks like. One is first we recognize that India is a federal system with states size big as Brazil and Nigeria and Germany. So any recovery has to be about a state recovery. And indeed, the future of India lies in the states of India. But the biggest story that's coming out of India is how it's completely changing the social protection system. We're in a world of shocks. There's going to be more shocks in the future, whether it's climate shocks, pandemics, income shocks. And countries have to begin to protect, protect not only its poor and vulnerable, but also its workers against those shocks. And final point, Paul, very, very important. The world's largest direct transfers to women-headed households. 300 million women-headed households get direct cash transfers, especially during shocks. That's what a recovery will look like in the future. Strong social protection to protect the poor, the vulnerable, and the human capital of India. So it sounds like social protection is playing this sort of central role in the recovery. When the bank is working with India, is it also really putting priority on sustainability in the recovery? Absolutely. There's some very, very important news coming out of India. First, India will be one of the very few countries that will meet its NDC commitments that it made in Paris at COP26. In particular, the energy intensity is coming down, uh, the level of support that you see from a green transition coming up. The fact that it'll keep its NDC so that its contribution to less than two degrees centigrade is big news for India. But that's not the only news. India is in the middle of some complex development transitions. These are transitions in the urban sector, in the energy sector, in the transport sector, the technology sector, and these are only few of the sectors. And as India succeeds in completing its development transitions, it will help the world secure its climate transition. That's how powerful the impact of India is globally. And, and for those of us who aren't as familiar with India and its, its kind of development story, talk to me about the significance of some of these transitions. And in particular, talk to me about what it's going to take to invest in the next wave of transition. So both the, the significance now and, and also like what the world needs to do to, to invest in India's greener future. I'll give you an example. Today, one of the biggest underground metros in a city is in Delhi and it, uh, it transports millions of people. You know, Delhi is a city of about 18 to 20 million people and growing. And that underground metro is a major public transfer, uh, transport uh, system. 60% of the energy of Delhi's metro is from a renewable park in Madhya Pradesh, a, a, a state hundreds of miles away. And the World Bank has helped uh, Madhya Pradesh developed that renewable energy park and the grid is transmitting that renewable energy into financing this transport system in India. Perhaps one of the most powerful one uh, that I often refer to, India is one of the few countries in the world that can have a passenger railway system and a freight railway system. Australia, Canada, China are, are the other countries that have it. But why, does, why would such a parallel system matter? As I mentioned earlier, if you can move freight from road onto the freight uh, uh, rail corridor, you'll take, uh, I would say, 30, 40% of the greenhouse gas emission from road transport and put it into electric, uh, electric uh, freight transport. Those are the type of shifts that we're making. And here too, the World Bank has invested in the freight corridor of, uh, of India. The next one, this is going to be the hardest question you'll probably get all day, and it's about you. I want to know what's the best part of your job and what inspires you in your work? I wasn't expecting that question. Paul, you know, we are very privileged to be working in a multilateral institution like the World Bank. It offers us a platform to make a difference in the world. And that, I think, is perhaps the biggest source of inspiration all of us get. To be in India, which can make such a huge difference on climate change around the world, it is a privilege. 
If the World Bank did not exist today, we would have to recreate it. And that's why I say it's a privilege to be working in this institution. Some inspiring words. Janet Ahmad, Country Director for India, thank you so much. Thank you. Wagwan. I'm Charmaine Wright from Kingston, Jamaica, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings. And now let's check in on the social media scene. Paul, what can you tell us about today's sure. conversation? I've just been talking to our uh, social media moderators who've been across the conversation throughout the day, and they said that many of uh, many people out there are reiterating online the need for comp comprehensive solutions that are green, resilient, and inclusive. We just had that conversation with World Bank Group President David Malpass, and he talked a lot about the, you know the intersection between debt yes. and finding these solutions. Uh, they've also told us the, mo the moderators have told us that a lot of the conversation is happening happening in Nigeria, Kenya, India, Canada, Ghana the UK, the Philippines, and Mexico. So hello to everyone out there in those countries and, and in other countries. Really appreciate you taking part. Yeah, that's great. And we also have some notable uh, comments coming in on Twitter. Can you tell me about some of those mentions? For sure, for sure. We heard from Badranin Nassim. Uh, they are with the Maldives Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they wrote in to say that learning more about debt financing and how countries can have a resilient recovery is the main reason that they looked turned, tuned in and mm -hmm. what they were looking forward to hearing today. Um, we also heard from Richard Watts, a senior advisor at Save the Children, who tweeted that the end of the debt service suspension initiative should be needs-based, and he hopes that for more new ideas, he's hoping to hear more new ideas to get private creditors to participate in debt relief efforts. And we heard from Kevin Watkins earlier in the program also at Save the Children there, so if you missed that, be sure to watch it back. It was a great conversation. Yeah, and we finally have Sonny from Nigeria on Twitter, and he was saying he's interested in a long-term overhaul to solve Africa's debt crisis. So great to see all this conversation on Twitter, but it's also happening on LinkedIn. So tell me a bit about, about what's happening there. For sure. We heard from Elizabeth Arundu. Uh, she is a financial analyst from Kenya. She commented that the uncertainty around eight to five jobs has been magnified by the pandemic, meaning kind of our everyday jobs. And she was saying that investing wisely will reduce over-dependence on salary loans. We know how she probably voted in the poll, making wise investments, yeah. uh, saving for the future, like you there. Um, and then we also heard from Akil, uh, a senior accountant in Ethiopia, and they wrote that making wise investments is the best choice, especially for import-dependent countries. So it really was a top vote. <laughs> it does. It sounds, it sounds like it, for sure. Well, you know, really love seeing all this conversation happening on our social platforms and hope it continues for the next couple of days. But now let's uh, go to our second country spotlight. And for this, we are headed to Benin. That's right. And it's from the capital city of Porto Novo that I recently spoke to country director Atu Sek. And I started by asking him about the challenges that everyday Beninese face when it comes to climate and COVID-19. Benin major challenges uh, uh, are job creation, uh, decent job creation, access to education and health services, uh, as well as water and electricity. So there are also climate related challenges, uh, including coastal erosion uh, and also uh, deforestation that affect communities' uh, life, livelihood. You, you mentioned there some of the climate challenges. Can you talk to me about the uh, West Africa coastal areas management system? And, and specifically, I understand that, that Benin has a 121 kilometer long coastline. How does the, the, the project, the, the areas management program affect that coastline? You may know that Benin coastal zone is extremely vulnerable. Uh, it is exposed to the highest rate of uh, coastal erosion in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, erosion can reach up to 15 meters per year here. Uh, the, the country also is exposed to, to heavy rain and, and, and floods. So, for example, uh, in 2018, there was a, a flood uh, that would have uh, affected 54 villages among the river. Uh, Mono River. So WACA provided fund for emergency protection work to, to stabilize the, the, the river bank, uh, uh, thanks to which uh, more than 25,000 vulnerable people living along the river were protected uh, from being uh, flooded. And I understand your climate portfolio isn't limited to the coast. You're also uh, doing work on uh, Benin's timber resources. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Benin uh, natural forests are uh, uh, harvested in an, an 
control manner uh, for timber, uh, but also for, for fuel wood. 85% uh, of the people population depend on wood and charcoal for their cooking needs. Uh, and uh, furthermore, natural forests are harvested for timber, for the make of furniture or for export. As a, as a result, Benin lost over 215,000 hectares between 2016 and 2017. So to reduce this uh, human pressure on natural forests, uh, we financed the Gazette Forest uh, Management Project uh, that is investing in large scale forest plantation as an alternative to the use of natural forest for fuel wood and timber. The aim is to establish 22,000 hectares of fuel wood and timber plantation uh, to contribute to the much needed wood energy demands in big cities such as Cotonou, Abome Calabi and, and Porto Novo. Fantastic. And, and just to shift gears here a little bit, it's 2021, we're a year into the COVID-19 pandemic. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about that and ask you know this about the situation in Benin. Tell me, what does a, a resilient recovery from COVID-19 look like in the context of Benin? We, we must learn from this crisis and uh, say that uh, uh, it has an opportunity to build a better world. It has not been easy for any human being around the globe. Uh, yeah, even worse for the most vulnerable people. Uh, this is definitely a new world now and we need to pay more attention to the nature and be more careful with climate crisis. We had been alarmed how deforestation, for example, is bringing the wildlife closer to human beings uh, and uh, how we can work to, to avoid uh, diseases such as COVID-19. So this is, in my opinion, how sustainable recovery will look like in the years, in the years to come. Just to, to wrap up on a lighter note, for those of us who might not be familiar with you or the country of Benin, talk to us about the best part of working there and, and what inspires you in your job. I'm really energized working daily with a dedicated professional in, in, in Cotonou and uh, in uh, the bank ecosystem and with client. Uh, we, these people are working relentlessly. Every single bank, rural bank staff must keep in mind uh, that our mission is to, to serve people. Uh, I feel privileged uh, to lead uh, such a talent team uh, that is more virtual now uh, and uh, dedicated also. I think I would agree with you on that. I think part of the best, best part of working here is, is all the great people. Um, but Atusak, country manager for Benin, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having the conversation with you. Hola, I am Jairo Bedoya in Montelibano, Colombia, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Green Meeting. Well, it's time to wind down for the day, but before we say goodbye, Paul, what can folks expect tomorrow and the day after? So it's hard to believe, but two days down, two more to go. We're halfway through the public events of the Spring Meetings 2021. Tomorrow, the focus turns to climate, and on Friday, the focus turns to vaccines. If anyone missed any of the programming yesterday, if you tuned in late today or you want to watch anything back, you can do so on the World Bank's YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe while you're there, but all the events will be there, including our uh, live discussions yes. that come off the back of them. Um, and I should also mention that tomorrow's live discussion, you'll be moderating that with Mari Pengestu and Stephanie von Friedeberg, all about climate. So yes. get those questions in, uh, live.worldbank.org. Get them in tonight, this afternoon, uh, and we'll get some of those questions to uh, Mari and Stephanie tomorrow. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a great conversation. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Paul. Of course, thank you, Sri. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And please do join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Washington, D.C. time for our event on climate. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>